Cocaine is merchandise. Merchandise to be bartered, sold, used, like any other commodity. Cocaine is money. And money is the root of many, many evils. Cocaine is a business, and every dollar that moved told a story. And when we started this case, we had no idea that it would ultimately lead to dismantling one of the most violent, most prolific cartels in Colombia. I had no idea what you were getting into. No, we didn't. We were babes in the woods. As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I had oversight of all 16 of our nation's intelligence agencies. My name is Mike Rogers. I had access to classified information gathered by our operatives, people who risked everything for the United States and our families. You don't know their faces or their names. You don't know the real stories from the people who lived the fear and the pressure until now. Public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. So in the 70s, heroin, it's the big issue. It's the big problem. It's why DEA becomes an agency to unify the government's efforts against the heroin epidemic. Cocaine wasn't an issue. It was, you know, rich bankers in New York and Hollywood types in LA. The user market is kind of small. Cocaine's very expensive. Drug traffickers are making money on it, but not a huge amount. Then in the 80s, when you make it into crack cocaine, it becomes much cheaper. What was $100 a gram is now a $10 rock. It's more addictive in that form as well. And the user base was massive. And when you had that huge, massive user base, that made the profitability skyrocket. This, this is crack cocaine seized a few days ago by drug enforcement agents in a park just across the street from the White House. That abuse of crack cocaine is really what fuels this huge rise in exportation of cocaine out of Colombia. Now they are sending tons and tons of cocaine to make crack. All the cocaine coming into the United States fuels violence in the streets of the city. It fuels addiction. It fuels the breakup of families. It's not something that is good for society. The crack cocaine epidemic in the United States produces massive profits for the Colombian cartels. Drug lords like Pablo Escobar, head of the Medellin cartel, they're making hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars at this point. They'll stop at nothing. American authorities say it was the Medellin cartel that ordered the murder of nine Colombian Supreme Court justices and the Attorney General, the murder of a key federal witness in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the murders in Miami of dozens of rival drug bosses. 1993, Pablo Escobar was killed on a rooftop in Medellin, but drugs in the, coming to the United States out of Colombia didn't slow down a bit. In fact, other cartels stepped right into that void. You have basically about two years where the Cali cartel is the undisputed kings of cocaine. When the Cali cartel was captured in 1995, this is when the North Vi cartel decides we're taking over and continue to supply the United States with cocaine. Cocaine is a cash business and the cartels needed to get the cash back to Colombia. I was an IRS criminal investigation division special agent in New York City. I was doing tax cases and I wanted more action. I want to knock down doors. And in 1994, my boss sent me to the El Dorado Task Force. I was a customs agent and I was a member of the El Dorado Task Force. It was composed of the New York City Police Department, state troopers, IRS, customs, and the El Dorado Task Force was put together in the mid-1990s to investigate financial crimes and money laundering. Around 1996, a confidential source told me this one money remitter in Queens, Tello Austin, was receiving bags and bags of cash and was sending it back to Colombia. What is a money remitter? 
Western Union, MoneyGram. It's an easy way to send money overseas. I took that information and I had one of the task force analysts run the figures. I believe at that time it was like 60 million in one year. I mean, for a money remitter that's sending $60 million is odd. As part of my investigation, I went to Tello Austin, the money remitter. I asked the super across the street, do you have any empty space? He goes, no, you go on the roof. So I dragged my partner who went up the roof and stayed out there for a week from when they opened to their close and see how many people went into that business. If they're sending 60 million, I expected 100 people, 200 people, like lining up in front of that door, like you're buying liquor on before New Year's Eve or something. But there wasn't. I went back to the Eldorado Task Force. I asked the analyst, hey, can you give me a report on Tello Austin on such and such date? How many people went in? How many people sent cash? And how many GTOs were filed, which is the geographical targeting order? What's a geographical targeting order? Do I really have to go through this? This is like brutally boring. You want to hear it from me? What's a geographical okay. targeting order? Prior to the geographical targeting order, you wanted to send more than $3,000 through a money remitter. You needed to show ID. When we realized that there was all this money going through the remitter community, we had it lowered to $750 to send any money to Colombia. Why Colombia? 90% of the transactions that were going through all of these remitters was going back to Colombia. So that underlined the drug connection to us. So when I got the report from the week that I was watching Tello Austin, it reflected that hundreds of people went into that business and sent cash to Colombia which dumbfounded me because I'm like, what the heck, I was out there. And there's no way that hundreds of people went there. Because I sat out there on the roof, you know, peeing in a bottle, watching that location for a week. I knew I had a big case here. I took my record of how many people went in and out, and I took the analyst reports from the Eldorado Task Force showing that hundreds of people went in to a prosecutor. But at that time, the prosecutor didn't think that I had enough. And I was complaining to Remedio. I said, Remedio, this is bullshit that I took all this and I can't get a search warrant. Then Remedio says, Danny, I know a great prosecutor. She's the queen of money laundering. The Empress, I would call her, not just a queen, I would say an Empress. My role in the investigation was as the prosecutor, the assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York, and I was a member of the Eldorado Task Force. And Danny explained how he'd identified a store that was moving an extraordinary amount of money. Once I looked at the documents, it was obvious that Tele Austin, on its surface, was a regular money remitter store. But that was really a front. Tele Austin probably did 3% legitimate business, and the other 97% was running drug money through the store, sending it back to what we eventually came to know as the Norte Valle Cartel one of Colombia's most violent cartels. We know we must do more because the drug cartels will do more. After all, there's a lot of money in this. Thank you very much. During the early 90s, there was the crack at epidemic. A dramatic shootout took place in a neighborhood in Colombia on Tuesday. Cocaine is what fueled violence in Colombia and in the streets of America. And this is what I signed up to do, was to go after these guys who are responsible for sending drugs to the United States. In our line of work, they always talk about two things. You can follow where the dope goes, and you can follow where the money goes. When you follow where the dope goes, you're going to get some underling. But if you follow where the money goes, you're going to get the head of the group. Money is what this is all about. One day I was sitting in my office, and an agent named Danny Min came in 
with the statistics for a store called Tella Austin, a money remitter store in Queens. Tella Austin was receiving 60 million in one year and was sending it back to Colombia. When you see a lot of cash going to Colombia, a lot of it was drug money. Tella Austin started with Tella Austin 1. It expanded to a second store, Tella Austin 2, to a third store around the world. There was just so much money running through these stores that one store couldn't handle it. I said, we need a search warrant for these stores. And right from the get-go, she was all for it. And, you know, she wanted to put bad people in jail. Tella Austin was one of the first GTO warrants. The GTO put in place a $750 reporting requirement. And in the case of the Tella Austin stores, their records showed multiple remittances just under $750. What is the likelihood that eight, nine, ten million dollars is sent through one store in a matter of days, always in $740 increments. We did three raids of the three stores, Tele Austin 1, 2, and Around the World Communications. We did them simultaneously that morning. We went in, secured the premises. There were, I think, two female employees. It was such a small place. Like, I didn't see cash, like, <laughs> piled up in the corner. But we found a phone book, a Spanish language phone book, and we saw so many names highlighted. It was weird. It hits you right there, you know it right away. They're using these names to send money to Colombia. Someone would come in with a bag, a duffel bag of half a million dollars, with a list of names randomly pulled from the phone book. The phone books were used to make up dummy receipts to cover the transactions. And on the flip side of it in Colombia, they would be given usually a fax of names. And when they got it on that end, they would know that that list of names was all meant for whoever was coming to pick it up. This is classic money laundering, and it's not peanuts, I mean, it's millions of dollars. We got to now find out who is it going to, so we had to keep on digging. Romedio and I began interviewing the women, it was exclusively women, that worked at these stores. But they wouldn't make any statements or give up any information. The women were petrified. As a prosecutor, I'd seen people concerned about deportation. I'd seen people concerned about being charged with a crime. But the level of terror that I witnessed in these women was something I hadn't seen before. And it took all of our interviewing skills to get them to speak. They would not take well to a typical cop approach of a man coming in, screaming and yelling and insulting them and calling them names. And Romedio and I had a different approach. To me, these girls just saw it as a business. They saw it as a way to make money. They were just poor people from Colombia who were being offered work. They just see it as a job. And so I've always kept that in the back of my head when I have interviewed these people, that it wasn't they were inherently bad people. It's, it's, it's a moral dilemma. Treat the witnesses with respect, be mindful of their concerns, and you'll get back from them. I heard that you baked cookies for informants. Is that true? <laughs> Are you really going to ask that question? People relax. You know, it makes people feel more comfortable. It makes the atmosphere less formal. And if it's less formal and people feel comfortable, they talk. And one of the things they talked about was a man named Ignacio Lobo. Mr. Lobo, which is wolf in Spanish, he was the manager on paper of the stores. And we got an arrest warrant for Mr. Lobo for money laundering. When he was brought up and arraigned, I remember distinctly telling Bonnie, this guy is not the man. He looked like a lost soul, and he uh, was afraid. And I, I think that's why for months he didn't speak to us. If we thought the women were terrified, Lobo was equally terrified. 
So then we had to determine who or what was behind Ignacio Lobo. So we went back to interview one of the ex-employees of one of the stores, a girl by the name of Isabella. Was that a real thing? Was she in danger? Yes, imminent danger of being killed. Isabella told us that the real owner was a fellow by the name of Juan Monsalve, also known as El Duro or El Loco, which means hard one or the crazy one. We had to arrest Monsalve, but we had no idea who Monsalve was. We ran him through various databases, and he really wasn't on anyone's radar. Lobo was our key to Monsalve. And eventually, Lobo opened up to us. And during our conversation, we said, the boss is Juan Alberto Monsalve. Who does he work for? And Lobo looked at me and said, he's the guy in Queens for the Norte Valle Cartel. That was the first time any of us had heard the name Norte Valle. And we came to the realization that this was something more than just a money laundering case. There was the first time I heard the name North Valley Cartel. This was something more than just a money laundering case. This was something really big. I didn't know at that time Norte Valle Cartel from anything. I didn't know what level, what, what kind of a cartel it was if it even existed, if it was just something Lobo was making up. But once the El Dorado Task Force discovered that there was an entity such as the Norte Valle Cartel. We pulled intel reports. We looked for any place that that name had popped up anywhere. I had a very good working relationship with DEA. They helped us immensely. We had our own independent investigation into the North Valle Cartel. So we had already identified who the leadership was. Other people that we had already arrested had basically been informing us of how the organization worked, how the hierarchy was organized. Some of those people had had contacts with the North Valley, and they made them readily available to us. Anytime we saw mention of the cartel, we reached out to the agent, we reached out to the prosecutor, and we began interviewing witnesses. From the witnesses, we learned that the Norte Valle Cartel was a drug cartel that arose in the mid-1990s. They made a lot of money. They shipped tons of cocaine to the United States. And there was a lot of bloodshed. While the Norte Valle Cartel aren't household names here in the United States, they were just as mean and nasty and formidable as Escobar. In fact, in the 80s, this civil war happens between the Medellin Cartel in the Cali Cartel. The Cali Cartel form a death squad to kill all the members of the Medellin Cartel. You know who those individuals were? The future members of the North Valley Cartel. The North Valley Cartel were all murderers and hitmen. Then, with the demise of the Medellin Cartel and the subsequent demise of the Cali Cartel, this is the moment when the North Valley Cartel rises up. 1995, they are the premier cartel operating in Colombia. And during the 90s and into the early 2000s, our intel analysts estimated that 60 to 70 percent of the cocaine entering the United States from Colombia was sent by the Norte Valle Cartel. These individuals in the Norte Valle Cartel, they're the ones at the end of the day who are responsible for fueling this crack epidemic, for fueling people in the United States abusing drugs. Okay, they are at the pinnacle of ordering murders, organized crime, millions of people abusing narcotics. These are the kingpins. These are the top individuals responsible for all of this. They have to be taken down. It never dawned on us that the search warrants at Tel Austin would lead to one of Colombia's most violent cartels. But once we identified Norte Valle, we wanted to figure out who was behind the cartel and bring them to justice. Now, our focus was not just on taking down individuals. We knew shutting down one money remitter, two more would open the next day. So we focused on the organization itself. But we couldn't go after the cartel 
until we had the link between them and the stores. One of those links was Monsalve, but we still had no idea who Monsalve was. We queried all the federal databases and found nothing on Monsalve. But we queried the local NYPD database, and there was Monsalve. We reached out to the NYPD officers who worked with the Red Rum Squad. That squad was tasked with solving violent murders in the Queens area. And through our work with Red Rum, we identified a witness who was the head of a squad of assassins that Monsalve used to murder people in Queens. The assassin was in custody in federal jail, and he was cooperating to get a sentence reduction. We interviewed him, and he told us Monsalve had several people gunned down because he was concerned that they were stealing his money or they were not moving his drugs properly. He would have hitmen walk into a bar and pull out a gun and shoot people. And the assassin said there was one woman who'd worked at Tela Austin, and Monsalve suspected that she was what Colombians call a sapo, a snitch. He had an associate of his offer her a ride on a motorcycle, and he sent a truck and a car to run down the motorcycle and then ran over her several times to make sure she was good and dead. Monsalve was a bad boy. You know, he had killed two people or ordered the death of two people here in New York. And he was the Norte Valle cartel's representative in Queens for receiving shipments of cocaine and laundering the money back to Colombia. And he lived here in the United States. So we issued an arrest warrant for Monsalve for murder, money laundering, and drug trafficking. But at that time, Monsalve had left the country and had gone into hiding. He was sort of like a phantasma. He was sort of like a ghost. And we had no belief that he would ever be coming back because we had heard he had moved back to Colombia, period. But two years later, in February of 2000, we received a tip from an informant who was living in the same building as Rebecca. And Rebecca was Monsalve's girlfriend and she had had a, a child with him. And the informant heard through the grapevine of the building that Monsalve was intending to come back into the United States through Mexico. The building was in Flushing, a hundred family building that Monsalve had used over the years as a stash house. A few days later, I received a call from this informant she said Monsalve was back, not only in the United States, but he was back at the building. We commenced surveillance of the building, 24 hours a day, waiting for him to come out. But he never did. Finally, one morning, Rebecca left with the child, and I dispatched an agent to follow her. So I decided I was going to try to get into the building and see if I could hear any noise. And if we did, let's just knock the door down and go get them. So I went into the lobby. Somebody walks out past me. I turn around and I said, son of a bitch. I think that's Monsalve. Monsalve is back at the building and we have to arrest him. So I went into the lobby. Somebody walks out past me. I turn around and I said, son of a bitch. I think that's Monsalve. And I go running up into the street and I don't see him. So I go running to my car because I want to go on the radio and tell the team that he's out. Find him, look for him. I've screwed up and I missed him already. And as I get to the car, I see a state trooper from the team out on the street with his gun drawn. He saw him 
in fact. And what Monsalve had done is he had walked across the street, gotten into a car with another person who was waiting for him. They've started to pull out of the parking spot. And that's when the team stopped the car and we arrested him. Monsalve was the first individual we arrested who had a direct connection to the Norte Valle cartel. And once we started, we weren't going to stop until we got to the head. If you want to capture and, and indict a top cartel leader, you don't follow the dope. They distance themselves from that. You go after the money. Our end game was not arrest Juan and seize 50 kilos. Our end game was not shut down this store and seize a million dollars. Our end game was to dismantle an entire cartel by following a money trail from a street level money laundering investigation. What was unique about Tela Austin was that these stores were owned by the Norte Valle cartel itself. There had been banks in Miami that had been co-opted by traffickers, but the Norte Valle cartel didn't need to rely on others. It could handle the money itself. So Monsalve was a crucial piece of the puzzle because he was the brains behind the stores and he could speak directly about the Norte Valle cartel. However, Monsalve did not cooperate. Monsalve just told us to pound sand. He didn't want to talk, and he sat in jail. With Monsalve not speaking to us, we needed to look for other links to the cartel. One of those links was Monsalve's right-hand man called Hector. Hector had managed Monsalve's drug operation in the United States. And we knew that Monsalve had dispatched him back to Colombia to assist in laundering the money back there and had day-to-day -day dealings with the cartel. And we had secured an arrest warrant for Hector. Later, in 2001, a very, very half-assed informant who was wrong the majority of the time told us that Hector's sister-in-law would be having a uh, christening in the Union City area of New Jersey. And Hector was going to come back to the United States for it, traveling under fake Mexican papers. It was August 6th of 2001. We sat out there and the informant called us in the afternoon after the christening and said Hector was there at the party. And we arrested him. Hector made a decision to cooperate. And I would say of the entire investigation, his courage, his decision, was really what broke everything open. Hector could paint a picture of the hierarchy of the Norte Valle cartel for us. He knew not just the leadership, but the lieutenants and the powers that be. In Colombia, Bonnie realized how important he could be to be able to get arrest warrants for these people. In Colombia. The cartel leaders, they don't come to the United States. They don't come to New York to hang out. Back in 1997, the Colombian government signed an extradition treaty with the United States government. So that meant we were able to arrest, in collaboration with the Colombian government, individuals in Colombia and send these individuals back to the United States for trial here. Once we had Hector's information, we began methodically building cases against each member of the Norte Valle cartel over in Colombia. It was time to take the investigation overseas. We began building cases against each member of the Norte Valle cartel over in Colombia. It was time to take the investigation overseas. Our goal was to round up the leadership of the Norte Valle cartel, extradite them here to the United States and have them stand trial for drug trafficking and money laundering. But there were many skeptics within my office, within law enforcement, yeah, you indicted the entire cartel. Good luck capturing any of them. That's where Kevin came in. The DEA assisted the El Dorado Task Force in capturing fugitives in Colombia. 
In early 2000, I was transferred to the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, Colombia, to our office down there, and was assigned as a liaison officer to work with the Colombian National Police to go after cartel fugitives, drug traffickers. This person's wanted in the United States, we're gonna catch him. In order to create some jurisdiction to go after drug lords in foreign countries, the U.S. government passed a law called the 21 U.S.C. 959, which makes it a crime to conspire to export narcotics to the United States. This law is designed to go after people like the North Valley Cartel, who are sending tons and tons of narcotics to the United States, but don't actually ever set foot here. And one of the tasks I was assigned was to put together the narcotics reward campaign, which advertised million dollar rewards for the capture of the leaders of the North Valley Cartel. It's basically the Colombian version of America's Most Wanted. Atención. Denuncia el paradero de los extraditables más buscados. Si cree conocer o sabe dónde se encuentran estos peligrosos delincuentes. We create a website, we had TV commercials, we had radio spots, we had newspaper advertising. Cinco millones de dólares. And then information starts flooding in. If you were going to name the three big jefes of the indictments, there was Archangel, Bustamante, and Carlos Patino, also known as Pate Moro. And Archangel was the first big fish. And we received some intelligence prior to the advertising campaign that one of the top fugitives in the El Dorado indictment was hiding out in Panama, Archangel Hanel Montoya. Arcangel was one of the leaders of the Norte Valle cartel. He was a prime target. Archangel was hiding out at a ranch called La Porcelana. We assess the intelligence, decide that sounds very, very, very good. We then mount an operation with the Panamanian National Police to go down and effect the capture of Archangel. I was under the impression this was going to be like other missions that we had done in Colombia, where it was going to be a remote ranch, very difficult to get to, guards outside. But literally, as we're driving down, there's a huge sign that says Finca La Porcelana, name of the ranch. Everything's right in front of the highway. There's a huge thatched roof eating area next to the pool, and there's about 30 people having breakfast as we drive by. I'm just going, oh, that's different than what we thought. So all the Panamans like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not waiting till Monday. We're just going to hit this right now. All right, it's your country. Let's do it. So we pull out our vests and our, our guns and take these four SUVs and drive right up onto the ranch. And I think law has changed. But a Panamanian police officer can't shoot someone until they give them two warning shots. So what do you think the Panamanians do as soon as they jump out of the car? <laughs> Blasting rounds into the air. We weren't prepared for this. I'm thinking I'm in the middle of a real gunfight. Luckily, no one was hurt, and the Panamanians were able to capture everyone on the ranch uh, without an incident. In January of 2004, Archangel was first major arrest and major extradition of the case. And with Archangel Hanel's capture, the ball started rolling. With the help of the advertising campaign that we had launched against the North Valley Cartel, more and more intel starts coming in, and we start using that to pick off these guys one by one. Targets begin to get captured. And slowly but surely, we charged people had people arrested, flip them, and charge the next two, and charge the next four. Starting with Archangel over the next half dozen years, we ended up arresting some 30 people and extraditing them all from Colombia. From ground troops to the sergeants to the lieutenants. Until finally we got to Luis Hernando Gomez Bustamante. He was better known by his nickname, Rascuño. He was also one of the kingpins of the North Valley Cartel, which was part of the last group that really controlled almost all of the cocaine trafficking in Colombia. He was untouchable because of his power and because of his reach. We had to capture Bustamante because we had worked for years trying to climb the food chain to take down the Norte Valle Cartel. But where the, where the hell is he? 
We couldn't find him. Bustamante went into hiding. He moves to Venezuela. He's hiding out in Venezuela, and he decides to go to Cuba. While entering Cuba on a fake Mexican passport, the official in Cuban immigration realizes that he doesn't speak like a Mexican, asks him a few simple questions such as, who's the president of Mexico? Sing me the Mexican national anthem. Neither which rescue you can answer. He's then taken into custody. Bustamante spends two years in jail on the fake passport charge. Eventually, the Colombians arrange for his extradition back to Colombia, where we're there waiting for him. And then he was immediately extradited to the United States. Bustamante was one of the acknowledged top leaders of the North Valley cartel. And when he was caught, showed us that we could climb the food chain to the end and be successful. Even though we had in custody Arcangel and Bustamante, Romedio and I just step by step kept going. There were other individuals to prosecute. One of those was a trafficker named Carlos Arturo Patino, alias Patimoro. Several of the witnesses told us that Patimoro is not happy with Romerio and I because we caused him to be arrested. And he had put a contract out on our lives. There would be a huge reward for someone who would kill me or Romerio or both of us. It was a big deal. Towards the end of the Norte Valle investigation, we arrested a trafficker named Carlos Arturo Patino, alias Patimoro. He was one of the hierarchy of the Norte Valle cartel and had put a contract out on our lives. It was a big deal. There would be a huge reward for someone who would kill me or Romerio or both of us. They took it seriously. They put us under 24-7 protection because Pate Moro was of the whole group in the Norte Valle, the worst of the lot. We had an informant who had worked for him, and he said Pate Moro used to have a wood chipper on his property. And he said that he would use that wood chipper to dispose of bodies. And I think it was the assistant who asked him, he said, were the bodies, were they always dead? And his answer was, most of the time. I lived with U.S. Marshals Protection for three months. Romerio had ICE agents, much to his dismay, following him around. I tried to keep my life as normal as possible. I took my kids to school every morning, but in an armored SUV followed by another armored SUV. I went to the gym. Sometimes they would take classes with me. Sometimes they would wait outside with their rifles. But I just went about life as normal. Were you scared? I wasn't scared until it was over. The day that Arturo Patino was sentenced to 40 years was the first time I allowed myself to get scared and then passed because it was over. Patino went to trial. He was one of the few guys in the indictment who did not cooperate and he got convicted in 2010 and then he got sentenced to 40 years. And he's now gainfully passing his time in some jail in I don't know, Pennsylvania, I think. Ultimately, after 12 years, we convicted 35 members of the Norte Valle cartel. This was a massive investigation, and it led to the dismantling of one of the most violent, most prolific cartels in Colombia. The El Dorado indictment was one of the indictments used to take down the Norte Valle cartel. It also exposed the money remittance system. The way they started out wiring money back is no longer available to Colombian drug traffickers. They've clamped down. There's new rules on the industry. It was a great example of starting on the streets with a low-level investigation and taking it all the way to the top. One domino knocked down another, knocked down another, to the end of the line. This was the biggest case of my career and probably the career of every other agent that ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> No, just, just kidding, just kidding. The irony of this case, actually, we never seized a kilo of cocaine. Had I not done the investigation, I wouldn't have made less money. 
Had I been unsuccessful, I wouldn't have been punished. And taking down the entire Norte Valle cartel didn't get me promoted or get me any bonuses. This was our job. I was a young man in college and wrote papers about Colombia and the cartels down there. To be able to get to go down there and participate in these investigations and capture these fugitives, it was it's what I wanted to do since I was about 16 years old. And the Norte Valle cartel was truly the end of an era. That was the last cartel in the way we think about it with Escobar or the Cali cartel. They were the last group that really controlled almost all of the cocaine trafficking in Colombia. The end of the story of the Norte Valle cartel is really the beginning of another story. As drug-related violence claims lives in Mexico, the governments of the U.S. and Mexico are keeping an eye on emerging drug trafficking organizations. Dead bodies hanging from bridges just minutes from the airport in Los Cabos. It's a war in which the finest forces Mexico can muster are struggling against well-armed cartels. I see a direct line from the Norte Valle cartel to what we see in countries like Mexico. The border city is one of the most violent in Mexico as rival gangs frequently fight for control over smuggling routes into the U.S. The violence you're seeing today in Mexico is a result of the shift of the route of cocaine leaving Colombia. Because under the North Valle Cartel, what used to be the major route for Medellin and Cali through the Caribbean directly into the United States shifts into Mexico. The North Valley Cartel makes a lot of deals with Mexican cartels, and they begin this whole movement of bulk shipping cocaine into Mexico. So after the demise of the North Valley Cartel, Mexicans take over distribution in the United States. And where there's a demand, there'll always be someone to give the supply.